All right, Brother West, if you'd open us in a word of prayer, please. Amen. All right. We are going to be studying this evening the seven judgments. Everybody have a handout? So you can start on Isaiah chapter 53. There are seven specific judgments listed in the Bible. And so we are going to look at those seven judgments. Starting in Isaiah chapter... 53. In Isaiah 53, we have a prophecy concerning our Lord Jesus Christ. Look in verse 3 of Isaiah 53. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. He hath made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. The soul of Jesus Christ was made an offering for sin. How? God's judgment fell on Jesus Christ. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. That's trying to explain that one. It pleased God to see His Son go through what He went through. Say, why? Sin has to be paid for. See, there will be a judgment on sin, and Jesus Christ took the judgment of sin upon Himself. Look in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. How was he able to take the judgment of sin upon himself? Well, he became sin. When Jesus Christ hung on the Calvary's cross, he becomes sin, personified. See? You look at the cross, you're looking at sin. And what's somebody doing this for? What's somebody wearing all these crosses? What is, that? what is that? Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Sin is, is, is cursed. And Christ is becoming a curse. See? Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. Galatians 3, I believe that's verse 13. Uh, he becomes sin. Second Corinthians 5, verse 21. For He hath made Him to be sin for us. Who knew no sin? Had Jesus Christ sinned? No. And yet He became sin on the cross. That we might be made 
the righteousness of God in him. As much as Jesus Christ became sin, you have become the righteousness of God. Isn't it good to have the righteousness of God? Yeah, but you don't just have the righteousness of God. You are the righteousness of God. You ever get a hold of that? He made, made the, we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. He was made sin so that we could be made the righteousness of God. God, where's your righteousness? And He points to you. <laughs> if you're saved, that's, that's it. That's what you got in Jesus Christ. Amen. Look in Galatians 3. Oh, I probably already gave the verse away. I read over my notes more carefully next time, not get ahead of myself. Well, there it is. I'll let you read it anyway. Galatians 3.13 Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Jesus Christ is taking the judgment of sin upon Himself. There's your first judgment. Second judgment is the judgment upon unbelievers in hell. Acts chapter 13. I'm in Christ. Every single person on the face of the earth right now is either in Christ or in their sin. See? You're either in Jesus Christ or you're in your sin. The reason I'm saved is not because I live a sinless life. The reason I'm saved is because I'm in Christ, the one who lived the sinless life. Acts chapter 13, verse 46. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it far from you, I'm sorry, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. How is someone proved unworthy of everlasting life? You reject Jesus Christ. God's judgment on sin is on Jesus Christ. If you're in Christ, your sin's already been judged. But if you're still in your sins, you still are waiting God's pending judgment upon sin. Look in Psalm 9. Understanding these seven judgments will help you greatly in understanding your Bible. Psalm 9. Look in verse 17. The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. That's the judgment upon unbelievers for their sin. Proverbs after Psalms. Look in the book of Proverbs. Chapter 15. Proverbs 15. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 24. The way of life is above to the wise that he may depart from hell beneath. There is a judgment pending upon sin. If you're saved, you're in Christ, the judgment's passed. Now, the best way to explain that is, is the illustration I've given it before on when they used to take them big old stagecoaches and and uh, go across country, you know, go west, young man, go west. And they'd, they'd go out there, and as they'd go out there, of course, they'd go through all those prairie areas. And out of them prairies, man, that wind will whip up. And what would happen once in a while is they'd get a big fire, a field fire, and those fields would just start to burning. And they're burning like that, and that wind's moving that fast, and that fire is just, the fire's running, literally, along the ground. And if you're downwind from that, and you got a uh, stagecoach with children there, there's no way you're going to outrun it. So what them guys would do is, is he would get everybody aside, he'd get an area, and he'd strike flint, and he'd, he'd burn a portion of that field. And then he'd take his whole family, or everybody that was with him, and they'd go right there where that ground had been burned out. And so now, when the fire would come, the fire couldn't touch him because the ground in that area had already been burned down. 
You understand? If you've come to Jesus Christ, you've already been judged for your sin. The judgment for your sin took place at the cross. See? If you don't, you're still going to have to have... Everybody has to have their sin judged. You can either have it judged at the cross of Calvary, or you can have it judged in hell. Second Peter chapter 2. If you have a concordance sometime, look up the word judge, judgment, judge, judgments, judging. Judge not. You know. You find there's a lot of judgment in the Bible. A whole lot. Second uh, Peter chapter 2. You all got it? Look in verse 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them, seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation, to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Say, what's, what's the story about the angels, the sin? Why is that in the Bible? So that you'd know about hell. What's the flood about? Why is God sending judgment? Why is only knows? So you'd know about hell. Why did God turn the cities of Gomorrah into ashes? So you'd know about hell. God's showing all those judgments through the Bible there to show everybody, hey, you know. The Bible says... Uh, uh, that Sodom and Gomorrah, he said that was an ensample. An ensample. Not an example. An ensample. What's an ensample? It's a sample. See? You ever get a, a little, like, sample bottle of shampoo? You wash your hair twice with it and, you know, it's gone, like hotel thing, you know? Right? That's just a sample of the real thing. See? God overthrowing Sodom and Gomorrah is a sample of the judgment that is to come. Amen? Alright. Um, look in 1 Peter chapter 4. And we're going to look at the next judgment. And that is the judgment by the Christian upon himself. Christians are, are to judge themselves to stay in fellowship with Jesus Christ. See? And this judgment has to do with fellowship. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 7. I have no idea where that verse came from. Oh, it's, it should be verse 17. Verse 17. For the time has come that judgment must begin where? Out of the house of God. If it first begin with us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? See? Uh, God judges His people. Judging you all the time, isn't He? Uh, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary when thou art corrected of Him. You mean the Lord ain't telling you just about every day what you're doing wrong? You mean the Lord ain't warning you when He says you're supposed to stop something? You see, you've got that witness within yourself. And uh, the Lord's judging you all the time. That's wrong. That's right. Start doing that. Quit doing that. Right? That's God's judgment on His people. And our response to that needs to be, I am going to judge myself See? Now, that chastening of the Lord can simply be the preacher getting up and putting his finger right in your face and getting in your kitchen and getting all over you. And you saying, oh God, have mercy, and you get right. And it's done. It's over with. Say, what about the Christian that doesn't go to church? Well, then I guess God has to go to other means. Problem is, is they don't even know it's God half the time because they're not in fellowship with Him. See? Oh, it just happened. It's just a circumstance. It's just a coincidence. 
No, if you're saved, God is going to judge you. And the best thing you can do is judge yourself. Uh, I'd much rather have a preacher get all over me and, and have to get down and get right with God and take care of it that way than another. See? Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Look at verse 12. This has to do with us judging one another in the church. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? You're supposed to. You know what the job of preaching is? That's one of the purposes. It's to judge you. It's, it's God's judgment coming through. But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. You got somebody that's not doing right and refuses to repent, and then God says, get him out of the church. Uh, admonish him as a brother. And uh, you'll find in 2 Corinthians, they accept this guy back into fellowship after he repents and gets right. And not before. You don't hear too much about that in uh, church discipline these days. See? But uh, it's still in the Bible. No, it's not out of it's not out of because I love you. It's out of uh, the Bible says to keep the right spirit in the church. What it is is it's putting the welfare of the entire church above one person. No, show me the scripture. No, it's not. That's not in the Bible. I can't say that because it's not in the Bible. The Bible says you judge them to keep the right spirit in the church. See? that the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Uh, look in chapter 6. Dear any of you having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world and that the world shall be judged by you? Are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know you not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them the judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak this to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you, no, not one, that should be able to judge between his brother, brethren? But brother goeth the law against brother, and that before unbelievers. The idea is, is there's people out there that are uh, suing other Christians instead of having that stuff resolved in the church. That's where the judgment is supposed to take place. Unfortunately, today, most Christians are taking it outside. And see, taking it before the unbelievers, which just kills the, uh, kills the whole testimony of, uh, of the child of God. Uh, look, look right here, verse uh, 4 of chapter 5. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, because you love him, You see that? Why? That the Spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. You see that thing? The Spirit of that church is more important than an individual who decides to be a rebel in sin when they know better. Okay? Now, as far as I'm concerned, if you're preaching right and doing right, anybody that's really doing wrong, they're not going to be too comfortable in church to begin with. So you, you can avoid a lot of those problems right there, you know, if you'll just take care of that stuff up front and just give light. But once in a while, you may have to judge something like that. And the idea behind that is God's church is more important than any individual. Do you understand what I'm saying? So that's, that's the idea with all that. But the main thing is, is, hey, if you judge yourself, nobody else has to judge you. Okay. Look in uh, chapter 11. 1 Corinthians 11. Verse 31. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. There you go. You want to avoid the chastening of the Lord? 
Stay in your Bible and let God deal with you on a continual basis and show you when you're doing wrong. Repent and get right. You know, that's and forsake. Okay? And that's, that's the idea. Uh, is uh, anybody here sinless? Well, then you better learn how to do this. See? That's the idea. Uh, that's the only way you're going to stay right. Verse 32, But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. See? That's God's chastening, is His judgment upon us when we refuse to judge ourselves. Look in 1 John chapter 1. First John chapter 1, verse 7. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Thank God. See? The Lord's blood is always available so that we can get things right and cleaned up. How many of you have showered this week? What's wrong with you? You had a shower? You know why? Because you're dirty. How many of you have confessed your sins this week? Oh, well, I haven't sinned. Yeah, okay. All right. You mean you like being dirty? I don't like being dirty. I try to confess my sins as much as possible. I like being clean. Amen? Uh, verse 8, If we say that we have no sin... We deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. <laughs> there it is. If you are walking in the light and you're going to turn around and say, I, I don't have any sin. You ain't walking in the light. You're walking in the darkness. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us most of our sins <laughs> and to cleanse us from most unrighteousness. No, all. Thank God. What a promise. You know what God has said? Anytime you want, you can get clean. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Amen. Take advantage of it. Get you a good bath at least a few times a day. Doesn't take that long. It feels good to be clean. Amen. Or you can just walk around saying, I'm just dirty. Great. Okay. Tell us something we already didn't know. Get clean. What's stopping you? Amen. All right. Um, let's look at it again now. Um, one more Hebrews 10. Hebrews chapter 10. So you have the judgment on sin at the cross or the judgment on sin of those that refuse the cross in hell. The judgment of the believer, say, I thought our sins were judged. They are in connection to our salvation, our eternal destiny. That's been taken care of. But in reference to our fellowship, see, we need to have our sins judged continually on a daily basis, preferably. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 30 for we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Well, thank God I'd rather do it now than do it later. Amen. Got a call from uh, Rusty. He got called in by his employers at UPS. He's been talking to other Christians at work. And I guess he said something that offended them. Uh, a lady and a, somebody else uh, posing as a man. And so instead of going to Rusty, they went to their boss. And so then Rusty got called in, you know, before the boss and had 
Now, he's talking to Christians. He figured, hey, what's the problem? I'm talking to other Christians. And those Christians, instead of telling Rusty, well, you know, uh, I disagree or I'd rather you not talk to me about it anymore, went to his employer to get him in trouble. I told Rusty, I said, does God know about that, Rusty? You know what they don't know? That right there. But I'll tell you what, the one thing you don't want to do is go against another one of God's children. You ever try and hurt another Christian, you have to stand before their father. And buddy, you don't want to, you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. It's not good. <laughs> I hope you fear God enough not to do that. Amen. But obviously a lot of, well, they say they're Christians. Obviously a lot of them don't. All right, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and the next judgment we're going to look at is for Christians. This third and fourth judgment, these are judgments specifically for the child of God. One is us judging our sin on a regular basis. The other is the judgment seat of Christ. Look in verse 9 of 2 Corinthians 5. Wherefore we labor... What's your motivation? Why are you laboring for God? Why are you serving Him? Wherefore we labor. That, whether present or absent. How many of you are present in heaven right now? No, you're not. You're absent. You see? Right now, you're still here. Are you accepted of God? But I'm saved. No, but are you accepted of Him? You see? You can be saved and not be accepted of God. He may not be approving of your life and of the things that you're doing. Are you being accepted now? And will you be accepted at the judgment seat of Christ? Your labors. That's what he's talking about. What you're doing for God. Will the Lord accept it one day? Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. Verse 10, for we must all appear. Now, you see that word says we, that's Christians, must, what does that mean? Count on it. It's going to happen. All, every Christian. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive all right, sir, there's something you're going to get when you stand before Christ. Maybe. Receive the things done in His body. See? According to that He hath done. Whether it be good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Well, in reference to the judgment seat of Christ, do we know the terror of the Lord? I don't know. Are we really convinced that we're going to stand before Jesus Christ and give an account for our works? See? That's what this whole thing's about. Yeah. Hey, it's, it's payday. And it can be a wonderful time or it could be a terrible time. Depending on your labor. Depending on your works. See? He said, verse 9, your labor what you've done in your body. You see that? Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians chapter 3, verse 8. Well, let's look in verse 7, for, uh, verse 6 for the context. I have planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. All right? Paul's serving. Apollos is serving. Who's bringing the fruit? Who's bringing the results? It's the Lord, right? So then, neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. All right? So you have labored for the Lord, so you have served Him. You're still nothing. Is, is that what he said? He said, you're nothing, right? Neither is he that planteth anything. 
neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now, he that planteth and he that watereth are one. We're all one in Christ, right? And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Now, you know what that means in the Greek? It means that every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Period. Are you planning for retirement? Because retirement lasts eternity. Are you planning for it? Are you putting up? Are you saving? Are you preparing for that day? Verse 9, For we are laborers together with God. You are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another man buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is... Jesus Christ. Always has to start with Him. Now, if any man build... Now, you see those words there? Labor, verse 8. Laborers, verse 9. Uh, verse 10, build. Now, verse 12. Now, if any man build... Labor, build... Does that sound easy? See, we have this idea that, well, I'm saved now and now I can just live a life of ease. No, where, where'd you get that from? That's not Bible. It's time to get busy. It's time to work for Jesus. It's time to prepare for eternity. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day judgment seat of Christ shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. God's just going to send forth a fire and it's just going to show everything you've ever done. What you've done that's brought damage and hurt and harm to the body of Christ. What you've done that's helped edify and strengthen and evangelize and serve Christ. And he's going to take all that. It's all going to come through. Everybody's going to see it. Everybody's going to know what you've done or what you haven't done. And then the Lord's going to reward you based on what you've done for Him in your body as a Christian. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of... Listen, he's not just going by how much you've done of what sort it is. See? What was your motivation behind it? See? What was your attitude in doing it? It's not just what you... It's not just, I did this. The Lord's checking the quality, not just the quantity of our works. Verse 14. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Isn't that wonderful? Who's going to give you that reward? Now, I don't know how else to convince you. I don't know what to tell you. You know one thing better than having the Lord Jesus Christ say to you, well done, and giving you a reward? I mean, come on. What could be better than that? If that can't motivate you to want to live for Christ and serve Him, I don't know how to do it. I don't know what to tell you. I just don't, I can't understand Christians that are just happy in this world. I can't understand it. Well, yeah. Well, they're at least happy enough with it to continue. So, you know, I, I don't understand it you're not going to get to go back and try it again. 
Right? You understand, this is it. One chance. One chance to do something for Christ, to have Him give you a reward. If any man's work, verse 15, shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. Did you notice that in verse 12? What can you build on the foundation? Gold, silver, precious stones? Well, they'll go through the fire. Wood, hay, stubble? Ain't going to make it through the fire. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, so is by fire. You're not going to burn if you're saved, you see, but your works will at the judgment seat of Christ. That's the warning to the child of God. Look in Colossians chapter 3. Look at verse uh, 17. And whatsoever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. All right, here's good works. Verse 18. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Now that's worth a reward. Amen? You've got to submit yourself to that rascal. Listen, the Lord understands that. That's why He's going to reward you for it. Amen. Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. All the nagging and all the talking and all that, you know. And you've got to love them anyway. And you can't get bitter at them. But if you do that, there's a reward. I know you're thinking, well, I don't know if that's worth it. But <laughs> it'll be worth it. I'm just kidding. Uh, children. You want a, re a reward from, from Jesus Christ? I mean, what if Jesus comes back before young people grow up? How are you going to get rewards? Obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. You get a reward for that. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service, not just when they're watching, as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart fearing God. In whatsoever you do. Now look back at verse 17. You see, this is all one passage. It's all connected. See verse 17, whatsoever you do in word or deed. Uh, and then he concludes verse 23. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. In other words, you're obeying your parents because you're doing it unto the Lord. You're loving your wife because you're doing it unto the Lord. You're submitting to your husband because you're doing it unto the Lord. Servants are obeying their masters because they're doing it unto the Lord. Verse 23, And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. There is nothing that Jesus Christ asks you to do as a Christian that won't benefit you now and won't earn you rewards by your willful obedience at the judgment seat of Christ. Amen? All right. Second John. You know, if a Christian is really serving God, and giving their best for their master, they enjoy hearing about the judgment seat of Christ. They can sing that old song, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. 
But if a Christian isn't, I don't think they appreciate hearing about the judgment seat of Christ too much. When's the last time you heard a sermon on the judgment seat of Christ on the totally backslidden network? Yeah. I mean, honestly, when is the last time on TBN you've heard a sermon on the judgment seat of Christ? And yet, that's supposed to be your motivation as a Christian to serve Christ. You know why they're all serving Him? So they don't lose their salvation. You see how that thing's been twisted around? All right, Second John. So I'm the nice guy. I'm the one telling them they can't lose their salvation. They're, them preachers are all telling them they can lose their salvation, and they run to them. Isn't that wild? Human nature, man. I, I, I don't know how the Lord does it. I don't know how He's put up with us this long. I say, God, I don't. You want to talk about long-suffering and mercy, man. Good night. All right, uh, 2 John, verse 8. Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Well, that means you can labor for Christ and serve Him and then lose some of that. Verse 9, how? Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. You get messed up in false doctrine, you can lose rewards. That's a warning from the Lord right there. All right, the next judgment we're going to look at is the judgment upon Israel. The judgment upon Israel, also known as Daniel's 70th week or the tribulation. Uh, look in Jeremiah chapter 30. Old Testament prophet Jeremiah chapter 30. Jeremiah 30 and verse 1. The word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. For lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, saith the Lord. And I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. These are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. For thus saith the Lord, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, and not of peace. Ask ye now, and see, whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins, as a woman in travail? And all faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. There's another word in the Bible for the tribulation. It's called Jacob's trouble. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. He's going to go through the trouble, but he's going to come out on the other side. See? He's going through the fire, but he's going to come out a vessel for the fire. And that's the idea. God's judgment, his final judgment upon Israel is what that is. Isaiah 4. We've seen God judge Israel all the way through the Old Testament and the New. But this is the final judgment on Israel before they are once again brought in complete possession of the land and once again rule the entire earth. Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 14. Well, that one too. We'll look there next. Isaiah 28 and verse 14. Wherefore, hear the word of the Lord, ye scornful men that rule this people which is in Jerusalem. Because ye have said, we have made a covenant with death, and with hell are we at agreement. Now, you'll read about them horses in Revelation 6. That last horse, that pale horse. You know, you know the name of the one that sits on him? Death and hell. Israel's making a covenant. Oh, that's right. Who do they make a covenant with? The Antichrist. 
See? They're making a covenant with the Antichrist. And God's going to judge them so that that covenant doesn't stand. We have made a covenant with death and with hell are we at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come unto us. For we have made lies our refuge and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. Deceive themselves into thinking the judgment's not coming when it is. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I lay in Sion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believeth shall not make haste. And we looked at that uh, Wednesday night about that cornerstone. Judgment also will I lay to the line, and righteousness to the plummet. And the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and the water shall overflow the hiding place, and your covenant with death shall be disannulled. Your agreement with hell shall not stand when the overflowing scourge shall pass through. Then ye shall be trodden down by it. And that's the judgment on that Jew during the tribulation. Nothing's going to get so bad at the end that the Jews are going to be eaten by the Antichrist people. Cannibalism. Because the world's evolved and it's so much more intelligent. That's what's coming. Uh, I'll show you that. Look in Isaiah 6. Verse 9. And he said, And go tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. That's Israel after rejection of Jesus Christ. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate. That's the abomination of desolation. And the Lord hath removed men far away. Israel flees to Sela Petra to hide from the rain and the wrath of the Antichrist. Verse 12, The Lord hath removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. But yet, in it shall be a tenth. A tenth of the Jews are going to go back to Jerusalem. And it, the tenth, shall return and shall be eaten as a teal tree and as an oak whose substance is in them. Skin them, fillet them, eat them. When they cast their leaves, so the holy seed, the Jew, shall be the substance thereof. Having to do with the oblations and sacrifices that the religious people under the rule of Antichrist will partake of. Eating the literal flesh and drinking the literal blood of the Jews. That's what I call judgment. That's God's judgment. Isaiah 4. Isaiah 4. What's God doing? He's, he's going he's to clean Israel up. When God shows up in the tribulation, He calls Jerusalem, spiritually calls it what? Sodom and Egypt. Okay. Uh, you talk to Sid White sometime about what's going on in Israel. We have this idea, well, they're Jews. They're very religious people. No. They're as wicked as Hollywood, California over there. See? I mean, they live like the devil. Amen. They do. They're wicked. Yeah, sure. Amen. Um, Isaiah uh, chapter 4, and look in verse 3. And it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion and he that remaineth in Jerusalem shall be called holy, even every one that is written among the living in Jerusalem. After the Lord comes back, those that make it through the tribulation. How? Verse 4. When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and shall have purged 
the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. See, the judgment has to come first. And the idea is, is after that and after they come through the fire, there's a holy people, there's a holy remnant that's left that enter into the millennial reign of Christ as the head of the nations above all the world. Amen. All right. We'll uh, go ahead and take a break there and we'll pick it up on the sixth judgment, the judgment of the world, also known as the end of the world. And uh, Brother Doyle, would you please ask the Lord to uh, bless our break, our fellowship and the food that we'll partake of? Father God, as we come to the end of the world,